Okay, well, we're going to talk about automatic volume control. You, you sort of all know your radio probably has it, but what is it and why is it there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is going to be sort of a technical presentation, so, so don't panic. <laughs> and um, you might want to start. Now, see, some, we, we have this dichotomy here. Some of us spent 50 years with our face in an oscilloscope, <coughs> and the rest of you guys were in banking or whatever, whatever you were doing. And, and so it's real different. <coughs> IT. So anyway, I'm going to encourage you to, to see if you can pick up some schematics as you're, read, as you're going through this. It's very important. Of course, you probably understand this. And it's a matter of symbols. I mean, you, you know what's going to happen there. I, I think you know what's going to happen there. And uh, you, you, you find, you know, you, you learn some symbols. You learn the circuits to go around them and, and just sort of move on from there. So you start with Dick and Jane. And you know, get, work your way to Moby Dick. <laughs> but really, when, when you can do this, stuff like this reads like a newspaper. You can pick it up, well, what's going on here? And, you know, just read it anyway. Uh, first, a brief review. Uh, take a look at basic vacuum tubes, and they talk about dynamic characteristics. Well, what does that mean? That means things are changing. And here's a vacuum tube, and it's set up. You've got an A battery that lights the filament. You've got a B battery that's connected to the plate and gets current flowing here through a load so that you can get some voltage out to the outside world. And then you have the grid, and the amount of current flowing here is dependent upon the voltage on the grid. So let's take a static case. Let's say we've got a 5K ohm resistor here, uh, 10 volts on the grid, and 6.2 milliamps of current flows. That's down in here somewhere, down in here. Now, if we move the grid voltage, dynamic, it's moving, take it through a range, we get a curve that looks like, like so. If that load resistor changes, well, then the shape of the curve changes, et cetera, et cetera. So let's use a little bit of that to take a look at the simplest vacuum tube amplifier, common cathode. That's because if you didn't, you have a circuit here, which is the input connected to the cathode. You have another circuit over here, which is the output. So it's a common cathode. You can build amplifiers that aren't common cathodes, but in the early days, then you'd end up needing a floating A battery to get it up above ground and do something else. So anyway, that's your basic amplifier. We have an input voltage. We have a load, B battery, C battery. And so uh, if we s choose a value for the bias battery, and let's say that's right here, we're at that point on the curve, and then to that voltage, we add an input signal down here and you can sort of imagine this wave bouncing off the surface, and that's what your output looks like. So that's what these, these curves and these sort of drawings are all about. And uh, there's, this number, there's this thing called transconductance. Uh, it's voltage in and current out, and if it were resistance, it would be what voltage over current, but it's current over voltage, so they call it MOS instead of ohms. And the word is transconductance, transfer conductance. The conductance in this circuit changes based on the voltage coming in. You can treat that as trivia. Now, schematics in general generally flow from left to right, and if you just follow your way, here's. Here's the loop antenna into the signal grid, out the plate, in the grid, out the plate, boom, boom, through here, and we're changing from RF. Here's local oscillator. We get IF, and the detector makes it into audio and out. So just sort of 
think about those concepts and that's, that's how you do it and that's how you analyze what's going on in your set. Uh, also wanted to touch on linear versus nonlinear. In that other drawing where we chose an operating point up in here, the output waveform would be an accurate representation of the input. But in this case, we've chosen a point down in here where that curve is no longer straight. And you'll see that this perfect sine wave now is distorted here. And if you distort a sine wave, that means you get harmonic distortion. You get extra signals in the output. And in most cases, you want to avoid getting into these nonlinear situations. So that's just a concept that, that will come up here in a little while. The other thing that can happen with your vacuum tube amplifier is you make this input really big, and now the output can only go this far, slams into the plate voltage down here, it slams into ground. You've made your, <coughs> your sine wave into sort of a square wave, and again, you get a lot of distortion, a lot of stuff you don't want to have. Okay, now, let's look at some radios and think about how we control the signal through the radio. And we're going to start here with a three dial, or in fact, a, an Atwater Kent 20C like we have in the, in the museum. And this is about 1924, and the radios are becoming sort of sophisticated. You have two RF amplifiers before you get to the detector. All three of those are tuned by separate dials, so it's a three dialer. And then you have two stages of audio amplification going out to the head, the phones or the, or the speaker. Now, <coughs> the problem in, in any of this situation is, well, you've got a five kilowatt AM station two miles away. That's real good on a crystal set. Uh, there's really some really big stations. There were legends about people hearing them in their teeth and things like that. But then on the other hand, you have some nighttime skywave station seven, eight hundred miles away, and it's listenable, but you need a whole bunch of amplification to do that. So this is called dynamic range, the range between the biggest signal you're going to deal with and the smallest one. And so here we have two amplifier stages, and so there's actually some amplification in the detector too. So you got a lot of amplification here, and you need to control that amplification so we don't get into any of those nonlinear distortion sort of situations. And what they did here is there's two rheostats on this radio. One controls the filaments to the RF amp and the detector, and the other controls the filaments to the audio amplifier. So you, in essence, have a radio frequency gain audio frequency gain, and you end up having to balance these to make the radio work. And in fact, in this radio, if you don't turn the gain up, you go trying to tune across the band with three dials, and you can't hear anything. So clearly, there's some improvements that could be made here if we had some way to automatically control the gain of the radio. Uh, another example, this is Radiola 18 from 1928. Now, this is getting to be an AC set. Uh, 26s are kind of like O1As that have one and a half volt filaments so that the uh, AC that's on them doesn't put too much hum into the set. But it's pretty much the same kind of thing, although by now they've figured out how to tie the three, the three, four tuning condenser, three tuning condensers together. This radio runs wide open all the time all the gain it can possibly have, but they've balanced it out so the, you know, the RF into the AF is, is good. And the way they control this is out here in the antenna ground circuit. There's a potentiometer, a variable resistor, a, a volume control right on the antenna. And that's how you do it. You still have the problem of, of blasting and missing stations when you tune across. So we're looking for solutions to that. So this will bring us to little-known radio he hero, Harold Wheeler. Uh, he was born in 1903, so he's a kid while this stuff's going on here. And 
Um, we've got a picture of him at, in his radio station. Here's a picture of him later when he was rich and famous. But about 1921, he becomes associated with a professor over at Stevens Institute named uh, Alan Hazeltine. Uh, Hazeltine was a, an electrical engineering professor, and he'd done uh, consulting for the Navy on the design of receivers through the World War I era. He had a pretty good hand. In fact, I think he's the one that put the, uh, the tickler coil in the Navy receivers so you could hang an audion box on them and make them regenerative. So he had a feeling for hooking things up like that. Jules? Okay, <laughs> that's cool. What, what was he? Was he a good guy? He was a terrific guy. It was an interesting company. The man was a genius. The engineer would work on problems. If you couldn't solve it, you went to see the boss, and he would solve it for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. He was building radar antennas on a subcontract for Bell Labs, and these were antennas that were used in the anti-missile radar. Uh huh. Okay. Well, so about 1921. Wheeler gets introduced to, to Hazeltine, and one of the conversations comes around to, you know, we had the, we're starting to have these RF amplifiers, and you have trouble with stability when you tune the input and the output, because that's how Armstrong built his oscillator. And uh, both Wheeler and Hazeltine had this concept of, let's feed some energy back from the output of the amplifier out of phase. And what that does is it pushes the gain down, but it makes everything nice and stable so the, so the amplifier will behave. And uh, one thing leads to another. They, they call this the Neutrodyne circuit. They patent it. Uh, Wheeler sort of becomes Hazeltine's first employee. He gets 10% of the profits when Hazeltine licenses out the Neutrodyne circuit. And they start doing this. Meantime, uh, Wheeler is still down in the Washington area, attending first George Washington University, and then uh, what's the famous one down there? No, no, the, the technical one. No, outside toward Baltimore. Yeah, Johns Hopkins. Anyway, he's He's an academic. He's well, he, you know, he's well schooled, but he was a radio guy in the first place. So they're making money on the Neutrodyne. He spends summers up on, up with uh, Hazeltine, I think, on Long Island, and they come around to well, let's solve the let's solve the automatic volume control problem. And so what Wheeler does, he says, okay. Normally, you'd have a, a grid leak detector here, and that just sort of gets you audio and isn't real good. He says, let's put a diode here. Of course, in those days, there were no good detector diodes available, so he just took a 201A and connected the plate to the grid. But you, the diode, here's, here's the radio signal coming in, amplitude modulated. The diode gets rid of half of that, so you have this audio signal that comes through to the audio amplifier and the volume, the AF volume control. And then we take this DC and through a large, uh, a large resistor and a capacitor, we smooth that out so it's proportional to the input signal strength. And we bring it back here and into the grid circuit of the RF amplifiers. And that changes the operating point. Remember that sloping curve? And we're up here to get maximum gain. Now we bring a negative voltage in there. We slide back the curve, and the gain goes. Down. I think I, have, I think that's the next slide here, just like so. So here's weak signal and strong signal. We move the operating point down here. We're now reflecting off this part of the curve, and we get a smaller output. So we have an electronic an electronically controlled amplifier. We can change its gain with a DC voltage. So they patent that. Uh, 
The, this is actually one of the most significant things we have in the museum. We have Har Harold Wheeler's prototype of the, the uh, diode AVC receiver. They called it the Washington receiver. Uh, I really got to trace the schematic of this out one of these days in, in detail, but I think it's TRF and you know the detector out here. It's interesting. He put a, uh, a milliammeter measuring the current through those tubes, and of course the current changes when you change the bias. So he in effect invented the S meter, the signal strength meter. But that's one of the best things we have in the museum. It's down there in the 1920s cubicle. So anyway, uh, Silco 95 in 1930. Now it's besides the AVC here. There's something that's interesting. By 1930, all those triodes out here have turned into tetrodes for two grid tubes, and a tetrode will get you a whole lot more amplification than a triode. Plus, what that they call it a screen grid. It's, a, it's actually grounded for RF, and that separates the plate circuit from the grid circuit so that the only coupling there is the, actually the electron stream through the tube. And the outcome of that is you no longer need the neutrodyne circuit, so you don't have to license it from Hazeltine, and he stops making money. <laughs> but meanwhile, he and Wheeler have a good idea, let's put AVC and radios, which come, become standard pretty quick. Philco 95 was the first one. Here we go. There's three RF amplifiers and a, and a, and a well, two, two, yeah, three RF amplifiers, a 227 triode that's connected as a diode, and then the, the DC path comes back to the grids and controls the RF gain of the set automatically. And over here, you have you know, what you recognize as regular volume control in the grid of the first AF amplifier. So you can decide how loud you want it to be. But as you tune across the band, the levels of stations will be pretty much equalized by the, the automatic volume control. Now, all was not sweetness and light. The, characteristics of the standard tetrodes and, and pentodes was kind of like this. And as you, down here is the grid voltage. And as you bring the grid voltage down, the current falls off. And you just get a very narrow range. You get down to about five volts and you cut that stage off completely. It stops amplifying. It probably starts distorting things pretty seriously. And so that circuit back in the, the Philco there wasn't, you know, was a good circuit, but, but it probably didn't work all that well. And what you really want is a tube that will have a much gentler curve down and won't cut off until way down in here. And so you have all of this portion here where the slope is flattening out, you can operate that thing down in here and get uh, gain reduction without a whole lot of distortion. Uh, these are known as variable mu tubes. Mu, remember, transconductance amplification, and it's variable. Uh, these are the ones you're, you may be familiar with kind of in, uh, in uh, chronological order. There was a and R RCA called these super control RF amplifiers. Uh, 3551 was a tetrode. Uh, that led to 3944, uh, which were pentodes. Uh, 58s, you probably have radios that have 6D, 6D6s in them, 6K7s, 6SK7s, miniature 6BA6. So they're all remote cutoff pentodes designed to go in gain controlled amplifiers. And in fact, each one of those tubes has a remote cutoff, a, a sharp cutoff version, which gets used in other circuits. Uh, and one of the things always bothered me, you look in these tube, tube substitution manuals, they'll tell you that it's okay to stick a sharp cutoff pentode in your remote cutoff socket, which, which it is, the radio will play, it just won't work right.
Wait, wrong direction. Let's go this way. So how how'd they achieve this miracle of remote cutoff? And the answer is in the grid in, in the structure of the first grid out from the cathode, the, the, the control grid. And you'll notice the pitch of the winding of the grid wire is not constant. There's big spaces and gaps in the middle here and then back, back together at the other end. And the outcome of that is here's the tube, your plate, cathode, edge view of the grid wires in here. And now you have uh, zero bias on the grids. Uh, they're showing electrical lines of force here. Put the arrow on the other end, and that's the direction the electrons are going. So there the, the tube is pretty much wide open. But as you make the grid go negative, portions of this start getting cut off as opposed to the whole tube cutting off. And so you get this smooth, and even down at 20 volts, there's still some electron flow. The tube isn't cut off. So that, and here's another picture of, of the actual grid. So that's how remote cutoff tubes are constructed and why they work and they're, they're real useful for our purposes. Uh, let's take a look at a simple, uh, at a simple modern radio. You, you surely own three or four of these and you've probably worked on them a little bit. Uh, the All-American Fives. Now we have a tube that's a dual diode triode. So you got a triode to be your audio amplifier, your first audio amplifier, and a couple of diodes. You don't always use them all. This, in this one, one of these is just shorted to ground. So you've got the IF output here into this diode to ground. That's chopping off the positive half of the waveform. This comes down here. Uh, there's a picofarad cap here that, that gets rid of a lot of the RF leaving the AF waveform, comes down to the volume control into the grid of this amplifier and out the radio. Meanwhile, we grab the DC portion of, of this thing through a high value resistor and a capacitor out here to low pass filter it so we, we get that signal steady DC signal is proportional to the signal strength, and we apply it to the grid of the IF amplifier. And the converter tube out here, the signal grid here in the middle, is also a remote cutoff grid. So it's boom, 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 and the capacitors here and over here that do the filtering. And like I often say to people, all these radios have AVC. But you look at the schematic, and if it wasn't highlighted in yellow, it's invisible. It's there. But if, but if it screws up, like if this cap gets leaky, then the radio is unhappy, and you wonder why. But uh, that's what it looks like in a, in a simple radio. Uh, now, you'll often hear, when you look at radio specs, you'll hear about delayed AVC. And it's not delayed in time, it's delayed in increasing signal strength. And here's what they're talking about. Here's the response of the radio output voltage incoming signal down here. Without any volume control, it's just going to be a, basically a straight line like so. And of course, you don't want it to get up into here. What you'd like it to do is come up to some moderate usable level and just flatten out, just flatten all the signals out so they're all the same strength. When you implement a circuit like that thing in the All-American 5, it does this. As soon as you get some signal, it starts reducing the gain. And so it's kind of like this. And you know those radios, even though you're tuning around, you'll find stations you have to turn the volume up, the, the audio volume up, et cetera. And the fix for that is to try to delay the onset of the AVC uh, to a higher signal level. And that often looks like this. In, in that All-American 5 schematic, 
the cathode of the audio tube was grounded. And just everything happened, happened. But in this radio, there's a cathode resistor here, which brings the cathode a couple of volts above ground. And what that means is that this signal going to the, the part of the signal that's going to the automatic volume control has to reach a higher level before it has any effect, before it develops any AVC voltage. So the onset of automatic volume control is delayed in signal strength, and it kind of gets you a more favorable curve in that, in that, that previous uh, drawing. Gets you, you know, something more like, more like this. <clears throat> anyway, uh, delayed AVC. Now, we'll get serious. Uh, warm spot in my heart for communication receivers. And what shortwave receivers, and what communication receiver usually means is that the thing has a beat frequency oscillator so you can receive continuous wave Morse code signals. And also, a lot of communication receivers, this is an S40, that's a, mod, a, a fairly low price Halicrafters. Uh, these make good broadcast receivers because you get an RF stage, you have two IF stages, there's six tune circuits in the IF. So it's a, a pretty good radio, you know, just even for messing around with. But it's got some additional controls and some additional things that go on here. In, the, in, in traditional communication receivers, the AVC doesn't really work on, on Morse code because when you turn on this beat frequency oscillator, it's sticking a signal either into the IF or directly into the detector. That looks like signal strength, and it pushes the AVC voltage down, reduces the gain. So what, what a communication receiver will normally have is a switch that will short out the AVC bus, and then there's another circuit in the cathode of the amplifiers, a res variable resistance here that will move the cathode voltage up and down with the grid voltage staying fixed. And so you can control the gain with a, a potentiometer out here, RF gain control. And so for CW, you normally open up the audio and turn back, turn on the BFO and turn the RF gain to where you want it. Uh, Well, you, that, it, some radios do that, but it's it's cheaper and simpler just just to just to take control of the of the cathodes. You could you could probably take control of the screen grid bus too, but but you know there's the the the, the simple way is is like that. Now while we're while we're on the schematic and you start talking about complex radios be it a broadcast receiver or a communication receiver. If you get to the point where you tune across the AM broadcast band and some of the, with AVC on, and some of the, and some of the stations have obvious audio distortion, and, and especially in a communication receiver, you can then switch over to manual volume control and find out you can fix it with the MVC. That isn't the way it should be. A good receiver will, will handle just ob obnoxiously strong signals, and you'll never know they're there. So if you start having that problem, you might have an AVC problem. Sometimes it's a little hard to figure out. And sort of the first thing you do is you make sure you have all good tubes and that everything is tuned up reasonably well. And then beyond that, here's the trick. Here's that AVC voltage being coming out of the detector heading into the, into the low pass filter and out here. If you look at the schematic, in almost all cases, there's no DC path at all out here. So what you want to do is open that circuit back here, stick your digital ohmmeter on here, and it better say infinity. Because this is a high, a high impedance circuit. 
if you got 10, megs, 10 megohms of leakage out here, that's a problem. If you have one megohm of leakage out here, it's a complete disaster. And that will be because these capacitors that are on that AVC bus are leaky. And that's one of the reasons I'll often advocate just, just get all the paper capacitors out of the set, period. But if you haven't done that and you have this problem, that's the way to, to troubleshoot the AVC bus and make sure, make sure it's clear. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Let, let, me, let me back up. Yeah. Wouldn't it be advisable to, to uh, detect the audio, specify it, and you see? I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll, I'll get to that at the end here. I'll get it. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Uh, I called this expedient repairs. There's, there's some, some radios, and this is, this is one of the, uh, the ARC-5 receivers. Uh, Aircraft radio designed these things. They're, they're, they're just gems. They're beautiful things. But all the capacitors are sealed in these silly pots here. So, and, and most of them are usable. And so it's a major undertaking to try to completely recap a radio like that. Another example is BC611 handy talkies. And some of those can be a real bear. But so you might consider getting the thing going, making sure there's no serious shorts and it kind of works, and then replace just the automatic, just the caps in the automatic volume control circuit. And in the case of this receiver, you could take a look at the schematic and find out, well, there's two of them. And you go in and you find those two, cut them loose from those cans and stick some discs in there or something. So that is just, like I say, expedient. Uh, these, these particular radios, there's, there's one that tunes the broadcast band, and it's an excellent DX set. And you might not want to go through all that aggravation when all you need to do is, is patch up the AVC and get the thing going. Okay, uh, just a couple of suggestions here at the end for advanced topics that we're not really going to look at. But to, by, you know, by, the, by the 60s and 70s, we had practical automatic volume control for CW. And single sideband is the same kind of situation. You've got this beat frequency oscillator running, and you don't have a carrier to key off of anyway. So there were some other advances made in automatic volume control, one of which was, as Lou was suggesting over here, audio-derived AVC. Rectify the audio signal, and that's already clear of the BFO and all that kind of stuff, and generate an AVC signal from that and send it back, in, back out into the RF stages. And that gets done in some receivers. Uh, some of the problem there is on the leading edge of things, you don't always have audio quick enough to, to have it not pop and click and things like that, but, but that's one of the, one of the solutions. Uh, there's also the concept of hang AVC, where you have a fast attack, maybe even amplified circuit that pushes the, the AVC voltage down real fast and then keeps it there so it changes slowly, hangs, and slow release. So there are ways to solve those problems. They're just a little more sophisticated than what you're going to find in, uh, in, in uh, broadcast sets. And, uh, and everybody did it different. So whenever you get into one of those things, you've got to pull the schematic out, pull the manual out, and, and see what they did. OK. that's. Pretty much it. Like I said, uh, AVC, I think, is a, an important concept, but it's, it's usually kind of hidden under all that other stuff. And I thought it was a good idea that you know something about it. Any questions or comments? OK, well, thank you. <laughs> Jules? <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that the vacuum tube had uh, transfer conductance. 
Yes. Conductance? Yes. Later on, a device was discovered with transfer of resistance, which we now call the transistor. Transistor, yes. <laughs> Good phone company guy. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again, folks. <laughs>